uh, talk to us about characterizing anisotropy of ferromagnetic brains, methods and challenges. So I would say the floor is yours, but it's more like the screen is yours, Andrea. Well, thanks a lot. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you about the many ways we have to characterize magnetic anisotropy and then especially focusing today on the anisotropy of ferromagnetic brains. We will have a quick overview of the different methods there are and what they can do, and then also look into the challenges that we are facing when we are measuring and then also when we are interpreting uh, magnetic anisotropy. But first, let's just remind ourselves why we should care about magnetic anisotropy and about characterizing magnetic anisotropy in a good way. So on the one hand, magnetic anisotropy is a very powerful tool that lets us efficiently characterize the average preferred orientation of minerals that we may have in our rocks. When we apply some tricks, we can also use magnetic anisotropy to define the alignment of course and then predict preferred flow directions. So for example, when we are interested in how groundwater uh, might flow in the subsurface. Then on the other hand, magnetic anisotropy is causing a lot of trouble for us paleomagnetists because it deviates the magnetization direction away from the field direction and also it affects the magnetization intensity. And that is a fact that has been known for a very long time that magnetic anisotropy on the one hand is kind of useful uh, because we can interpret it in terms of tectonics, in terms of deformation. And on the other hand, it's really a pain because we have to correct for it. So when we want to use anisotropy to interpret deformation or emplacement processes, um, or in the case when we're measuring uh, pore fabrics, also the flow field, then we might use uh, an approximation that, well, maximum susceptibility indicates the lineation and the minimum susceptibility tells us the pole to the foliation plane. There is also an empirical relationship that relates the degree of anisotropy to the degree of the strain and in the case of looking at pores, we, we could link the magnetic anisotropy to permeability anisotropy and therefore also to preferred flow direction. Now in that second case, we will have to find a way to correct for and in a way undo the effects of uh, anisotropic remnants acquisition. And this is a very important step in paleomagnetic studies because it has major consequences, for example, for our paleogeographic reconstructions. And therefore, many methods have been developed basically to get rid um, of these anisotropy effects. And we will hear about some of them in later talks today. Mathematically, it all seems to be very simple because magnetization is an isotropy tensor times field. So if we want to invert that, we can say that the field is the inverse of that tensor times the magnetization. The big challenge that we have is that we have to define that tensor K. And that is basically what I want to talk to you about today. So although these applications that I was talking about are related to very different fields within the earth sciences. One is kind of structural geology tectonics and the other being paleomagnetism. The aim that we have is the same everywhere, right? We want to get an accurate description of the anisotropy of the relevant grains. 
In the case of paleomagnetism, these relevant grades are those that carry the remnants. And in the formation and tectonic studies, the relevant information that we might want to get on the formation stages might be carried either by the paramagnetic grains or the ferromagnetic grains, could be carried by primary or secondary grains. And what we basically have to do is to define which grains we are interested in and then characterize their fabric. So let's see how we do this experimentally. And I want to start with the part that kind of everyone would agree on. And if we start with the basics, I'm going back to my equation of magnetization equals susceptibility tensor times field. And well, we all know that this tensor K is second order, it's symmetric, it has eigenvalues uh, that I'm gonna call here K1, K2, and K3. And we also know that we need at least six independent measurements if we want to describe K fully. And if we also want to estimate the data quality, we are gonna do additional measurements. Geometrically, we can represent that tensor K with an ellipsoid, which is what you see over here. And in this ellipsoid, the axis of the, or the lengths of the axis are going to correspond to the eigenvalues and the orientation um, of the axis are going to correspond to the eigenvectors. So far, that was very easy. And now it starts getting complicated because this is just a, a very quick overview of the methods that we could apply. And we already see here that there are so many ways how we could measure magnetic anisotropy. And this list is, uh, is not even covering all the other methods that are out there. So by far the most popular method is low field AMS. A measurement only takes a couple of minutes and we get a very quick estimate on the average magnetic fabric of the rock. When we measure low field AMS, we can use that as a first order approximation. We might also try to interpret that, but it's really hard to interpret because we have this integrated measure of all the minerals, all the grains in our rock. And when all we have is the low field AMS and we don't know anything else about our rock, then this might be very complicated to interpret in terms of tectonics. And then we also should not use that to try and correct our paleomagnetic data. But we could also measure susceptibility and isotropy in high fields. This takes a lot longer, maybe one, one, one and a half hours uh, per sample. But it also allows us to then separate the magnetic and isotropy carried by paramagnetic minerals compared to ferromagnetic minerals. And if we are interested in ferromagnetic minerals, that is one method we might want to apply. And then there is a whole group of methods that uh, focus on remnants and isotropy. And with all these methods, the principle is the same. We are applying a remnance um, in a known field. So we know the direction and intensity and then we measure whatever our sample has acquired. And it's really great that we have so many methods available, but it also makes it kind of complicated because now we have to decide what do we want to measure. Uh, one consideration that we may want to make is are we going to measure directional magnetizations or are we measuring magnetization differences? If you're measuring directional magnetizations, then we are getting the full tensor, which we see here. And if you're measuring magnetization differences, we are only getting the deviatoric tensor. Second, we need to decide whether we are measuring in-field, so whether we are measuring susceptibility or 
if we are measuring the remnants. And then we also have the option to vary the field, vary the measurement temperature, um, vary the frequency. And this is really great because there is so much we can do and so much information we can get out of the rock. But it's also the tricky part because we have so many options and we need to decide. Coming back to that first question, directional magnetizations or magnetization differences, often differential measurements are going to be more accurate, but then we do not get the full tensor with those. We might do differential measurements when we are only interested in a fabric orientation. Um, but if we then want to do, say, in an isotropy correction, we need a full tensor. So we would either measure the full tensor right away or supplement the deviatoric tensor with a signal directional measurement. The susceptibility versus remnants question is going to have different answers depending on what you're interested in. And I'm showing you an example here of a rock with all its different minerals and brain populations. Now, all of these are going to contribute to susceptibility in various degrees, but only some will contribute to remnants. And if we want to correct remnants directions, we should then also measure the anisotropy of remnants. When we are interested in the fabric of the paramagnetic grains, then we would measure paramagnetic susceptibility. And we can further uh, separate the different grains if we are taking advantage of the different field or frequency dependencies of the, the minerals and grain population. So all the grains that we have here in the rock, they are going to react differently to the formation. Also, they may have formed at different times. And what we're seeing over here is that while well, some grains, they might actually have orientations that are controlled by other grains. So in this rock, we have uh, silicate hosted magnetite needles that form the sex solutions um, and we see here that all those needles actually have um, one of two sets of orientations. Then we know that the minerals contribute in different ways. For the paramagnetic minerals, we have magnetocrystalline anisotropy, that's important. And then for the magnetites that we see here, we are looking at a combination of shape anisotropy and distribution anisotropy. And all of this together makes it quite complicated to then interpret the magnetic fabric, um, especially when we are measuring kind of the integrated low field AMS. Now, of course, at the same time, this makes it very interesting because a single rock contains information on several deformation events. And well, basically, our job, if it is to reconstruct the, the rock's tectonic history, is that we should isolate all these relevant fabrics. Now, a very important point here is that first thing we might want to do when we try to characterize our rock is that we measure its bulk properties. We are doing all the rock mag experiments, and then we find out, yes, this rock contains magnetite. So surely magnetite will also carry the anisotropy. And this is not always the case, as is shown here uh, with these little sketches. And we can think of this as a rock that contains magnetite in black, biotite in uh, dark gray, and then some other minerals such as uh, quartz and feldspar in light gray. And when we look at this example on the left, Magnetite is going to dominate the bulk properties, but it is not going to contribute to remnants because we, no, it's not going to contribute to the anisotropy because basically all the grains are uh, round and we don't have a distribution anisotropy. Now, the same compositions and probably the same rock magnetic measurements we see in these other two examples, 
But in these other two examples, magnetite either has shape anisotropy here in the middle or a distribution anisotropy here on the right. And in those cases, magnetite is actually going to contribute, might even control the anisotropy. So this is just a, a small illustration that shows us that whichever mineral dominates the bulk properties does not necessarily dominate everything else. So which minerals do I see now with the different methods um, in my rock? So we are again taking this uh, oxide gabbro that I've shown you before, and I marked in black the grains that we are looking at. With low field AMS, we are looking at everything. With high field AMS, I can separate between the paramagnetic and the ferromagnetic grains. And then when I go into remnants anisotropy, I am looking at the remnants carrying ferromagnetic grains. And what's important to see here is that the ferromagnetic grains that carry susceptibility and the ferromagnetic grains that carry remnants, they are not necessarily the same. With the remnants anisotropy, we can then further distinguish, for example, between the smaller and more elongated grains, which have a higher cursivity, and the larger and more isometric grains that have a lower cursivity. And we already see here that the actual ratios of these grains, as well as their preferred alignment, are quite different for each of the images. And this is also why different methods then see different uh, magnetic fabrics. And essentially, this is the reason why it's recommended that we are correcting paleomagnetic results with remnants anisotropy of the corresponding grains, um, rather than taking AMS or a different type of remnants anisotropy. Sometimes we might be lucky and the AMS and remnants anisotropy are coaxial to each other. But even if that's the case, um, there might be differences in the anisotropy degree or the shape of the anisotropy. And I just want to show you an example here of what this might look like. Um, here, I'm showing different anisotropy measures that all came from the same sample. And what we see here is well, we have the AMS and we have the high field AMS, and then there are a couple of AA rounds and a couple of AI rounds uh, measured in different fields. And what's interesting here is that, for example, the low coercivity AA RAM and the ferromagnetic part of the high field AMS, they show a very similar orientation of the fabric, while on the other hand, kind of all these other remnants anisotropies of the higher cursivity grains, they show a different fabric. Now you see that with all these many methods, the plot is quite messy. I'm not showing any AT rams here because uh, the rock altered during those measurements. And I'm also not showing the confidence ellipses here just because the plot is already messy enough. But what I can tell you is that these differences in the fabric orientations that we see, um, they cannot be explained by measurement uncertainties. And then, of course, what we also see is that basically the low field AMS is giving us an even different uh, direction. And the big question now is, of course, which of these is the correct K, right? Remember, we still have this aim that we want to uh, define K. And that question is gonna have a different answer, of course, depending on what we want to do. Um, when we want to do an anisotropy correction, then we can not only use one of these, uh, tensors, but we might actually need several. And this is what I'm showing here. Um, sometimes it happens that 
Well, imagine that, that this is a rock and I demagnetized it completely. And then I gave it a, an, an ARM in the lab in a single magnetization step with a known field of a known direction parallel to the Z axis. And what came out was this. Um, when I then demagnetized that same ARM that I gave my rock in the lab. And this looks quite different from what I would expect, have expected from a single component magnetization to look like, even in a rock that is anisotropic. And here we clearly start talking about challenges, right? Because how would we interpret that if we did not know that this is an artificial eminence that the rock acquired in a single event? Well, we might argue that it could be three components or two components. Um, on the other hand, what we would expect, well, if there is no anisotropy, we would just expect our magnetization to be parallel to that set direction in which I magnetized. And if there was an anisotropy that is the same for all the grains in the rock, we would have expected um, still a single component magnetization, but just deviated from that direction. In any case, I would not have expected that very complicated uh, behavior that we've just seen in, uh, in this sample. So what we did is we tried to correct for this. And we basically said, well, different anisotropies for different subpopulations of grains, they can result in some artificial multi-component magnetization. And when we measure a series of different AARMs in different coercivity windows, then we might be able to correct for that. So what we're looking at here is data where the measured uh, demagnetization curves are in gray. Those that I corrected for a bulk tensor are in blue, and those that I corrected for a series of tensors are in red. And what we see is that in the beginning, we would probably interpret the measured data as a multiple component. We would also interpret those blue curves as multiple component. And then, well, the red curve is still kind of messy, but it looks, at least in some parts here, it looks much more like a uh, single component magnetization. Big question here is, how do we choose the tensors that we measure? Because, well, I could measure this another one for every demagnetization step, but then I would get a very uh, large noise level. And when I have the large noise level in my anisotropic correction, that's then also affecting um, the error on my corrected direction. I don't have an answer for that, but I also want to show you another challenge. And that is, well, what happens when we have uh, nonlinearity. So basically the anisotropy theory is all based on the assumption that the magnetization is linear by field. And that is that simple equation that I've shown you where we say M equals K times H. And we've known for a very long time that this is not the case for the AI rounds. Um, I have to say that I'm definitely guilty of still presenting my AI rounds as second order tensors. And then stating that, well, I know this is not mathematically correct, but I simply do not have any better way of showing that data. Now, what I'm showing you here is that we actually might have the same problems with AARMs. We often don't check for this uh, because we use very low fields and we assume that we have the narrative of these low fields. Uh, but we should be aware that even in this 0.1 or 0.05 millitesla fields, the ARM is not necessarily linear by the field. And that's what we see here for different rock types and also different AF windows. 
Very similar problem would then occur when we measure torque, so when we measure high field AMS. What we see here is kind of the expected signal if we have a second order tensor. In the case uh, that everything is linear, we expect this signal to be independent of field because we're using high fields when we are looking at magnetite. And we are expecting this uh, to increase as a function of fields cleared in the case of paramagnetic minerals. And this is not what I see here in my oxide cap row. So what I see in the oxide cap row, first of all, it's not a two feet up signal, which is what I would have expected. Then I have higher order components. There is no symmetry with respect to the zero line and also the shape of the curve is actually changing with the applied field. This might also cause problems when we are trying to do high field AMS measurements using hysteresis loops because there we are often assuming that we can normalize with the saturation magnetization. So what if what we think is the saturation magnetization is actually not saturated. Um, we are using this normalization to correct for artifacts related to the positioning and the shape of the sample. And when we cannot uh, assume that we are saturating the sample, then we do not have this option of correcting the directional hysteresis loop. What's really interesting in this kind of data is that I can easily model that type of behavior when I'm assuming a magnetite with a very strong shape and isotropy. What I'm showing you here is just a two particle model, but I can also do the same calculation if I have enough time for the entire 20,000 particles um, that were identified in the fin section. And I would essentially see the same type of behavior. So a curve that depends on the field in which I measured, no symmetry, um, and not this nice uh, two theta signal that I would expect for a second order tensor. The big question here is how do we describe this if we have higher order components in the tensors? One way that has been used is uh, to use contour plots. And then some final thoughts um, are related to the representativeness of our laboratory remanences. We are basically relying on the assumption that whatever we measure in the lab is an adequate proxy of the anisotropy of natural remnants like this. Now, of course, we know that these are very different time scales, and it could also be very different processes. Paleo intensities, they are normally corrected for cooling rate effects, but then who tells us that these cooling rate effects are not also directionally dependent, in which case the anisotropy would also be affected. And then, as I said, processes could be different. So for example, a depositional remnant should not be corrected with a simple AARM. Rather, we need to take into account the single particle anisotropy. Um, and that's because the process of a DRM and an ARM acquisition are fundamentally different. And then finally, the AARMs, they are often taken as a good room temperature proxy for the anisotropy of a natural remnant. However, we are still facing issues because while the physics of the ARMs are not very well understood, and one point there is that we have a decay rate dependence in our ARM measurements. Now, again, the question, of course, is which is correct description of our tensor K. Um, there are other open questions 
So what happens when we have, for example, vortex or flower state grains? What kind of anisotropy do they have? What about field induced anisotropy? Um, what about switching field angular dependence or gyro remnants? And then on some of these topics, we will actually hear more today. And I'm really looking forward to that. Before we move on, I want to conclude, first of all, with a big thanks to everyone who contributed to our actually quite advanced understanding of magnetic fabrics and who helped develop um, all these methods that we have now to extract fabric components. Then we've seen that magnetic fabrics, both measuring them and interpreting them is quite complicated. We can see different orientations, different degrees and shapes of anisotropy when we measure the same rock with different methods. And well, this makes our life difficult, but it's also really fascinating because we can get so much information from a single study. Now, because of this complexity, of course, we need to very carefully choose how we're measuring magnetic fabrics, given our application. And some questions that we might want to ask us there is, what minerals do we want to target? Do we, are we interested in susceptibility? Are we interested in remnants? Um, is it enough to measure a single tensor? Do I need several tensors? And then, of course, there are still open questions, such as the nonlinearity, or also how do we correct and how do we propagate errors um, in anisotropy corrections. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing new studies um, on these topics and also on bridging the gap between our lab measurements and then what happens in nature. Thanks a lot for listening and then I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Andrea. So Suzanne will be looking at the chat window for questions and I'm looking at hands. Um, are there any questions for Andrea? There's nothing in chat at the moment. Uh, I have a question, if that's all right. Yes, go right ahead, Richard. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, so one of the things that we're doing increasingly now is uh, imaging rocks in three dimensions using X-ray tomography. And I was just wondering, so we can measure the like orientations of, of different mineral phases in, in 3D, but I don't have a good sense of how strong a deviation from a random distribution of particles is, is required to explain the sorts of anisotropies that you see. I mean, is it is it just a fraction of a degree or is it much larger? Um, because if it's too small of an angle, you won't necessarily pick it up with X-ray tomography, but it, if it was much bigger, then you could measure that. So yeah, so how, how, how big a deviation from a randomness, let's say your biotite crystals that you showed in your schematic were all sort of very obviously flattened and lined up, but in reality, do they have to be that? But they don't have to be as extreme as well, what I've shown in the, in the image. Uh, what we can do is both for the paramagnetic minerals, so for the, for the biotites, and also for the, for the magnetites is um, when we know how they are oriented, we can simply run a model and then predict what kind of anisotropy we would get. One of the problems that I encountered with the XRCT is that I only see the larger grains. So, you know, I still have my, my picture here from the, from the oxide gabbro. And I did try to get like all these tiny exolutions and in the XRCT, you basically see none of those, right? What, what, what you do see are these larger grains. And what would be very interesting is uh, once we get that resolution with the XRCT, we do have the model to calculate the, the shape and distribution and isotropy. 
uh, once we get the resolution from the XRC team to just take whatever we measured and then run it through the model and predict the anisotropy. Right, what degree of alignment we need to measure a certain anisotropy that very much depends on the single crystal properties. Sure. Right, with olivine, the highest anisotropy, if it's totally aligned, is uh, a p-value of uh, 1.06 to 1.08, depending on the iron content. If I'm looking at a, an amphibole or a pyroxene, I can get p-values of 1.3, 1.4. Okay. Thank you. So I saw Lisa, you had your hand up, but now it's down. Do you still have your question? If not, we'll move on to Wynn, who has also his hand up. I, st I still oh. do have a question. <laughs> well, then the floor is yours. OK. Um, so with IRM, we have this Heisenberg principle where just measuring the IRM changes the um, coercivity of the sample. Um, the sawtooth IRM acquisition problem. Um, the, it must be true that it's similar in ARM, but um, does anybody worry about that? That uh, by applying an ARM, you change the coercivity, and so you can never really know what the uh, ARM of the pristine, the original sample, the ARM anisotropy of the original sample was. If, you, if you're looking, it's not a saturation thing. Maybe I'm not clear, but it's too early in the morning. <laughs> well, Lisa, I really appreciate that you got up so early in the morning. Um, I'm not sure I can answer your question. With the, with the ARM or you know, with the AF treatment, of course, what, what we did see is that we, we, ob we obviously get the, the field-induced anisotropy. Yeah. What I never tried is what happens if, you know, say I'm measuring the same AARM tensor, but I'm switching around, for example, the directions mm -hmm. or the order of directions. But that would be a very interesting... It's, it's a very simple test. You, you just uh, give an ARM this way, measure it, and then an ARM that way the, in the opposite direction and measure it. And if they're the same, then you don't have a problem. But if, they're, if it, the second one is lower, then you have the same problem that we see in IRM. And it just would astound me if we don't. <laughs> Something I'll have to try. Right, and then also, does it matter uh, whether I measure X, Y, Z, or if I measure X, Z, Y directions for, for the tensor that I'm getting in the end? Right, and it will. Maybe. I'm, I'm, I think in, in samples with, uh, if there's purely uniaxial, then you don't have this problem. But if, you, if it's not uniaxial and isotropy, you will have this problem. When? You can ask your question if you want now. Uh, when? Hi. Yeah. So this is um, kind of following on from what Richard said, and a little bit from Lisa. I, I probably would uh, agree with Lisa. I guess if anything, any process that changes the domain state is likely to change the certainly low field susceptibility. Um, but in terms of your modeling, I was wondering, uh, you know, Richard's talking, talking about these trellis uh, interconnected uh, elongated structures that you get in X solutions that are likely to be interconnected, probably. You know, you're looking at the surface uh, structures there. But, well, actually, no, that, I guess you, you, you did, uh, these are 3D um, uh, structures you've got, right, from micro CT or something. Is that right, Andrea? Well, what I'm showing here is uh, is just a backscattered electron image because with the XRCT, I did not have the resolution right. to actually see the smaller grains. Okay, but but I wondered uh, what effect 
on the susceptibility you would have if you had these elongated, elongated uh, sort of pipe bike structures or lamella type structures that were interconnected. Maybe it's too complicated a question to even think about, but undoubtedly it'll have some effect on the susceptibility. Maybe that's too horrible a question to ask. But the modeling you're doing is just is isolated single domain grains, right? Is that right? Right. Yeah. So the modeling I'm doing is um, I'm basically taking this image, and then I'm assuming that all I all I see are needle shaped particles. Yeah. Of course, I could also assume platelets, but then I have to. Um, make more assumptions on their orientation. So the easiest uh, that I do is I say whatever I see here on this plane as the longest axis, that's the symmetry axis. And then I'm making prolate ellipsoidal grains out of them. So there are some assumptions in there and some simplifications. Okay, okay. we have a question from David Finn. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is related to Lisa's comment and that that issue with the plus and minus IRMs. And something I've always been curious about is, is that feature that she mentioned um, with the ARM. If you do IRMs plus and minus really fast and you continue to do them and slowly back it off, it's just like an AF, right? Um, is that feature GRM? So you're doing the plus and minus IRMs really fast. If a small component, component was off to the uh, perpendicular direction, the plus and minuses along the field direction cancel, and then you get a GRM. And I think Potter and Stephenson in 2006, you know, kind of suggest that. Um, but I don't know if you guys, if this is <laughs> relevant, that was sort of my question. Is that possible, I guess, is that? is the question. Andrea, you want to comment? Well, I'm not really feeling comfortable to comment on GRMs, but maybe someone else wants to comment. <clears throat> uh, France, we have a follow-up uh, question from Richard. Yep, go ahead, Richard. Okay. Well, uh, just just following up on the this issue of tomography and, and what you see and what you can't see, I, I think the solution to this is is um, a kind of multi scale approach. So we certainly have tomography methods where we can image exactly what you're seeing in that BSE image in in three D. So so Evan Nicolaisen and and Suzanne and I and Carl just recently published a paper where you, where you can you can you know, in very enormous detail, look at the, 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 the 3D distribution of particles on that size. But of course, you're only doing it on a tiny field of view. And so the trick, I think, in the future is going to be how can we combine that kind of super high resolution, but very limited field of view data with much larger field of view, but lower resolution data. And I think, I think that's kind of an interesting, interesting way that we could uh, approach that because you, you you can't, there isn't a single tomography method that will give you the, all of those things, but some combination of them could. Yeah. Then, I was wondering what the development the genetics, And then I think you have a, a route to actually doing this, but only if, if the, the, the angular resolution is, is, is good enough to, to sort of pick up the sorts of textures that you're dealing with on a large I was wondering scale. if developments in the sort of uh, nano CT or micro CT or whatever scale they call them, is, there, is that a promising avenue as a development? Well, it, it all all is, but you always have this trade off between field of view and resolution. You know, we can mm -hmm. I can do we can do three D imaging to arbitrarily high resolution these days, or right, down to the atomic scale, right? But the trade off is on field of view, and 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 these sorts of problems that Andrea presented really are multi scale problems. You need to know the fine detail, but you also need to know the whole sample. So I think. That, 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 I don't know whether that's a, an approach that you're thinking about, Andrea, whether that might be useful. 
Right. I mean, it's it's certainly the you know what one would have to to try and do, right? So if you say you have that three D data on the particles, it would be very easy to just run them through the model and then predict what kind of NSO3 would you would expect from that very small part of the sample. And then of course the question is, is that representative for the entire sample for that you could then compare it to the measurements that was made on the on the entire sample. Yeah, it's scaling that up, that's the next big problem to, to be solved. Yeah. yeah. Do we have other questions? I don't see any hands raised anymore. And the chat box is empty. We well, maybe covered the question. Thank Andrea for this uh, really good introductory talk to this session. It gave us a, a good overview. And, and like, she's, like she said at the end, uh, some of these uh, special problems that we'll be seeing in, uh, in some of the, the, the rest of the talk for this uh, afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time zone that you're, that you're in.